Hey, what's up YouTube? I've been exploring Niagara's experimental dynamic mesh interface, and since there isn't much information about it out there yet, I thought I'd make a quick video to share what I've learned. If you're familiar with the now somewhat deprecated procedural mesh component, or the newer dynamic mesh component used with geometry scripting, this interface should feel familiar. The principles are the same. You define a set of vertices and triangles, build each triangle by specifying a list of vertex indices, and then manipulate the vertices to procedurally construct a mesh one triangle at a time. Here's a simple example with a single triangle. At the emitter level, I created a dynamic mesh parameter. Here you can configure the number of sections. In this case, we'll create one section containing a single triangle. The material index is set to zero, so the materials array must have at least one entry to define which material to use. We need three vertices to form a triangle, and we also need to compute or estimate the mesh bonds for occlusion curling to work correctly. Most of this can also be set up in a scratchpad module. Just create a dynamic mesh input, wire in the emitter's dynamic mesh, and call the necessary functions. Keep in mind that these are CPU level functions, so they must be called at the emitter level, not at the particle level or within a simulation stage. On particle update, I have a second module to quote-unquote construct the mesh. This involves setting the data for each vertex, position, tangent, normal, bitangent, texture coordinate, and vertex color. Then creating the triangle using the corresponding vertex indices. Remember, the triangle's normal is determined by the winding order. If you use 0, 1, 2, the normal points one way, 2, 1, 0, and it points the other. Counterclockwise is generally the standard. Next, add a mesh renderer and set the mesh parameter binding. You can also enable material overrides, but that's optional if you've already assigned a material. And that's it. Here's a mighty triangle. Let's take a look at another example, this time creating a screen space quad. It's the same idea, but now I'm creating two triangles, which means I'll need four vertices. In the construct module, I used a bit of HLSL to simplify things. Using the camera query interface, I get the screen to world transform matrix, which lets me convert each corner of the screen into world space coordinates to position the vertices. Then I just created the two triangles and that gives me a screen space quad. I took it a step further by creating a 2D grid and a render target. The number of cells for the 2D grid is set here, and the render target size is set here. In the first simulation stage, I used the gbuffer interface to sample the scene color and store it in the 2D grid. Then, in a second simulation stage, I queried that grid and wrote the result into the render target. The screen space quad uses a simple unlit translucent material with a texture parameter. So I can override it here and assign the render target as the texture. One thing to keep in mind, for this to work, you still need to assign a static mesh. It will be overridden by the data from the dynamic mesh interface, but for some reason, the material parameter override does not function correctly if no mesh is set at all. Without a mesh, it seems the material can't access its parameters properly. Anyway, this essentially creates an additional render pass with a custom resolution. Not sure how useful this is, but hey, it's just an example. Obviously, the sky is the limit, and I've yet to fully understand how far you can push this. Here's something I tried though. This still doesn't look very impressive, but I'm taking it step by step. This single grass blade is procedurally generated using Niagara's dynamic mesh interface, and the core idea remains the same. Allocate a bunch of triangles and vertices, 
assign the correct vertex indices to each triangle and set vertex attributes like position and so on to build the mesh. The vertex positions are driven by a basic quadratic curve. It's relatively inexpensive to compute and works well for modeling a simple grass blade. From this curve, we can also derive the tangent at any point, which allows us to compute the full tangent basis for each vertex, tangent, normal, and bitangent. Here's a simple struct that makes it easy to define functions inside a custom HLSL node. It's a bit of a dirty hack, and ideally you'd want to include a separate source file instead. Next, I sample the landscape at the emitter's origin. This is where I want to place the grass blade. Then I create three points to define the quadratic curve. I generate the triangles, assigning vertex indices to each one. The final segment only needs a single triangle, so I handle that part outside the loop. For each segment, I sample the quadratic curve to get the local position, which is then converted to a position relative to the mesh's origin, and this will be the emitter's origin. Then I create the tangent basis. The bitangent lets me offset vertices away from the curve, giving the grass blade its thickness. And finally, I set the vertex data position, tangent basis, texture coordinates, and vertex color. And that's basically it. Now, let's take it a step further. What you're looking at is still a single mesh that is procedurally generated and animated using Niagara's dynamic mesh interface. Now, this is just an experiment. There are many things to consider when generating grass blades on the GPU. How do you split them into clusters for proper occlusion cooling? How do you handle terrain projection? How do you provide artist-friendly tools to control where grass can be spawned? How do you manage when clusters should be generated? And so much more. It's a deep, deep topic, and I encourage you to watch this tech talk to better understand that what I'm demonstrating today is by no means a solution that's close to being shippable. It doesn't even seem to be particularly efficient, to be honest. I suppose Niagara's dynamic mesh interface comes with a fair amount of overhead. Or maybe I'm doing something wrong, or both. I also overlooked the fact that in the Ghost of Tsushima approach, most of the heavy lifting appears to be done in the vertex shader. I thought it was entirely done using compute shaders for some reason, so this might be a completely wrong direction. Amit Meha shared another potentially much more optimized method using his own Niagara Dynamic Mesh Renderer plugin, which is available for free. Feel free to look into it further on your own. There are also things I haven't figured out yet, like shadow casting, writing to the velocity buffer, and so on. But still, this is an example of something potentially more useful than just generating a single triangle or a screen space quad. But this is just that. Just an example. Alright, so previously we had a bit of code to generate a single grass blade. And to create multiple blades, we can wrap that logic into a small function and call it in a loop. The key difference is that we are still building a single mesh. So when accessing triangle and vertex indices, we need to apply an offset to correctly construct each new grass blade. And of course, the triangle and vertex buffers must be sized accordingly. Another challenge is creating clusters. To achieve this, I cheated a bit and made use of invisible particles. The first step is attaching the Niagara system to the pawn. I went with a solution that's probably over-engineered. Feel free to keep it simple. It's really just about getting the pawn and attaching an actor that owns a Niagara system component to it. This way, the emitter's position matches the pawn's position. Based on the size of the cluster grid cells, I snap this position to the nearest cell. Then, each particle is distributed in a grid pattern using its linear index to create a unit position within the grid. This unit position is then converted into a proper grid position based on the number of cells and the cell size. This results in a system where each particle is evenly spaced in a grid pattern and follows the pawn while being snapped to the nearest grid cell. So although the particles move, they jump from cell to cell, giving the illusion that they stay in place. 
Now, these particles are what I use to dispatch the correct number of computators needed to generate the grass blades. So the next important step is to cull the particles, preventing the system from generating grass for clusters that are not visible. To do that, one might start by deprojecting each particle's position from world space to screen space and checking if it lies outside the screen. However, this approach is flawed. If only the center of the cluster is out of view, the entire cluster would disappear. A better solution might be to perform bounding sphere frustrum culling using the cluster's radius. If the cluster is within view, it should be included in the compute shader dispatch, otherwise it can be effectively quote-unquote removed by simply killing the associated particle. That said, the same cluster might become visible again in the next frame if the point of view changes, so that particle might need to be respawned, if that makes sense. But to keep things simple, instead of respawning just the right amount of particles, I actually implemented a one-frame counter on all particles. Every frame particles are spawned, culled and killed if necessary, and then killed in the following frame. This cycle repeats every tick and you never actually see it happening. Like I said, these particles are a bit of a hack to let me dispatch the correct number of compute shaders to construct the grass blades. So when accessing the vertex and triangle buffers, I need to apply an offset based on how many grass blades each cluster should generate, the number of vertices and triangles per blade, and the execution index, which represents the cluster index. In HLSL, this simply translates to the following. To access the first vertex of the first grass blade in, say, the second cluster, you need to offset the index into the vertex buffer by the number of vertices handled by the first cluster. That is, the number of grass blades per cluster multiplied by the number of vertices per blade multiplied by the cluster index. The same principle applies when accessing the triangle buffer. On top of that, I also wanted to experiment with using simulation stage iterations to distribute the workload within each cluster. Each iteration would be responsible for generating a portion of the grass blades. And that's simply a matter of controlling the start and end range of the loop that calls the grass blade generation function. Now, each time the function to construct a new grass blade is called, its parameters need to be randomized. Randomization is a crucial part of the algorithm because each grass blade in a specific cluster, at a specific loop index, must generate the same position jitter and parameters every frame. This ensures that the result is exactly identical from frame to frame. Since everything is computed every tick, the whole system has to be deterministic. It's not too complicated. First, you can generate a seed using the cluster position and the grass blade's position within that cluster. The cluster position is snapped to the grid, so it remains consistent across frames. If the cluster moves, it will move exactly to the position of another cluster, effectively swapping places and making the transition invisible. Likewise, the grass blade's initial position within the cluster is based solely on the fixed number of blades per axis, so it also stays consistent from frame to frame. Long story short, the fixed predicted initial position of each grass blade can be used to generate a unique seed using a simple hash function. Using this unique seed, a simple seeded random float function can generate randomized values like thickness, height, position jitter, time offsets, and so on. With these parameters, the grass blade construction function can be called. Now, about wind. I kept it very simple here. Wind is simply modeled as a sine function that offsets the mid and end points of the grass blade's quadratic curve. Each segment is then spherically reprojected and voila, you get an animated quadratic curve. It's super cheap to compute and a bit limited, but it works well enough for the purpose of this video. 
Of course, you could replace this with something more advanced, like sampling wind data from a texture or other sources. The sky's the limit. The same goes for interactions. For example, assuming my pawn is a sphere, whose position I already have because the emitter is attached to it, I simply do a distance check to see if any quadratic curve segments collide with the sphere, assuming the sphere overlaps the cluster. And voila! Keep in mind, nothing stops you from generating the mesh and handling some of these calculations in the vertex shader instead of the compute shader. You could encode the grass pivots directly into the UVs when constructing the mesh, then apply wind and interaction effects per grass blade in the material like you'd usually do. To be honest, I'm struggling to draw a clear conclusion from this little experiment. While the overall concept isn't flawed, procedural grass is a well-established technique used in many shipped titles, this particular implementation performs extremely poorly and I'm not entirely sure why. On paper, it seemed like it had a lot of potential. Many of the calculations, usually done in the vertex shader to compute wind, interactions and whatnot, are often redundant across vertices, so the idea of computing things just once per grass blade felt like a solid optimization. Additionally, the quadratic curve point data could be stored in a buffer to be persistent across frames, which would open up the possibility of implementing algorithms like point-based dynamics to simulate each blade individually, reacting to wind and physical interactions with momentum, drag and whatnot. But yeah, there are still a lot of unknowns here, so I'll let you be the judge of whether it's worth pursuing. Let me know how it goes if you give it a shot. In the meantime, I invite you to take a look at this tech wizard's work to get a glimpse of a similar but more performant approach using a custom Niagara renderer. That's it, thanks for watching, please consider leaving a like if you liked the video and subscribing to the channel. Files are available as a tier 2 reward on my Patreon, and thanks to my patrons for the incredible support. I'll see you in the next video, take care of yourself, bye bye!